Okay, so thank you and thanks organizers and uh, uh, editors for the uh, invitation. It's really my honor to speak here. So I want to introduce to you a new technique that we developed. We call it uh, neural network uh, renormalization group. So um, I guess this is already kind of a, a defining feature of deep learning. That's a, a figure from uh, the deep learning book. You see it's uh, from page six. That the second figure of the entire book. So if you train a deep neural network, so typically the uh, low-level neurons they pick up about details, fine-grained features. And uh, if you go really deep into the uh, higher level, they get some kind of emergent concept about the shape and so on to make the classification. Of course, this is a reminder to physicists about the uh, renormalization group. And uh, there are already quite some papers uh, actually. In this room, there are uh, several authors, uh, French uh, and uh, uh, my chap talked about that. So let me also bring this to your attention. That's uh, uh, another kind of a perspective that about the vulnerability of the deep neural networks. So that's a quite famous example of also called the adversary attack to a neural network. So basically, you can train a classifier that, that it works. However, if you apply epsilon perturbation to the input, like this, you can kind of confuse the neural network, let it believe that it's a 99%, this is not a panda, it's a gimbal. So in an RG language, this is like uh, um, applying the right perturbation in the so-called relevant direction, such that you drive the flow away from one fixed point to another one. So this is rather uh, worrisome if you really want to later de deploy the system into, for example, self-driving cars, or medical diagnosis systems. Because if we do not understand what's going on inside the neural network, so how should we trust the result? So I guess with that, let's kind of set up the stage, the motivation. So RG on one hand side offers some kind of understanding of deep learning of the deep neural network. On the other hand, this is the topic of this talk, that uh, we hope that by really making the concrete and a very constructive connection, that you can employ many of the techniques developed in the deep learning community for studying challenging problems. So in particular, you can really make use of the uh, programming framework where they have differentiable programming of, of the very deep neural network. Also, you can enjoy many of the hardware accelerations. I'm speaking of GPUs. So uh, that's with my students at IOP, Chinese Kingdom Family of Sciences. That's a paper you can check out our uh, code online. It's written uh, in PyTorch, so uh, with a few lines of tweak, you can uh, enjoy the GPU acceleration. So uh, let me introduce to you the approach from uh, this kind of perspective. This is all also how we get the inspiration and how we got started. So this is a tensor network representation of a quantum state. So we have heard that quantum state lives in a very high dimensional space. Uh, we do not know how to efficiently store them. And tensor network is a class of efficient way to parameterize a uh, quantum state. So this particular one is called the uh, uh, mirror. It has this be beautiful internal structure. To really get a kind of understanding, let me enroll it. There is a nice way to understand the mirror as a quantum circuit. So sitting in the bottom, that's my entangled quantum qubits. Thinking about spin one half and so on. So that is my state. And all those blocks in the tensor network, that's unitary quantum gates. So that block tries to uh, remove short-range entanglement between those two qubits. And uh, at second layer, all those triangles, they take two qubits information in, and as an output, they only pass one bit information uh, to the next layer. The other ones, we want it to be uh, in a fixed product state, zero. Okay. So basically, uh, if you go on, you will see that uh, you are doing transformation to a few and fewer uh, number of qubits. So essentially, it's a way to remove entanglement uh, in a hierarchical way from your quantum uh, uh, system. However, we know that a quantum circuit is reversible. That means you can also run the whole quantum circuit uh, in a different way from top to bottom. Then this is a quantum state preparation scheme. So basically, starting from uh, all qubits initialized 
at the zero stage. You apply kind of entangled quantum uh, gates that try to prepare your interesting state. So that is the setup of a mirror as a circuit. And uh, uh, basically, what we want to do uh, with classical data, with neural network, is a counterpart uh, of a mirror in a classical meaning. So basically, I'm drawing, drawing the same diagram. But now I'm saying that this is a neural network. It's not a tensor network. So it deals with the classical data. So in the bottom, I'm having uh, classical continuous variables. So to be concrete, you can think about, uh, uh, for example, the, uh, field, uh, the, the, the position of atoms of a, a static matrix system. Or you can think about a five-fold model, IC model, if you want. That's uh, classical data with correlations. Uh, the distribution is very complicated. And uh, each block is a bijective neural network, meaning that uh, it runs both ways. The purpose of those uh, neural networks is tries to remove short-range correlations between those variables. And uh, I want to remove them, in, again, in a hierarchical way. That means at every second layer, I stop doing transformation to some of my variable. So I call those variable latent variable. It has a cross there. So in analog to qubit, now I want those variables to satisfy independent Gaussian distribution. While for the remaining ones, I call them collective variable, and I pass them on into the network and continue to do transformation. As an outcome, the network transform away correlations from, the, uh, from my physical system and map the whole thing to a Gaussian. So in machine, language, machine learning language, this is called inference. So I'm infer, inferring the value of latent variables. They conditioned on the uh, given observation of classical uh, physical variables. However, since the whole thing is uh, bijective, that means I can run it backwards. So from top to the bottom. So basically, I draw an independent sample of Gaussian random variables and pass them through the network to get my physical variables. So this is a generative model, as we heard, that you can generate physical configurations directly by direct sampling. So um, I know this is very dense, um, because I'm throwing to you uh, at one single slide uh, half, half a year of work. But anyway, uh, if you only take one slide and one equation from that, uh, that talk, so it's going to be this, this equation and that slide. So basically, this bijective mapping not only induce the transformation to the data, it also induces the transformation to the probability density of the data. Because essentially, that's a change of variable from different space. So that means that the probability density in the physical space and probability density in the latent space, that related by this change of variable equation, log determinant of the Jacobian determinant. So since we know that log density from state map, that Log density is basically the energy function. So I'm reading this equation as the renormalization flow of my effective energy from the physical space to the latent space, which is Gaussian. OK, so this is very dry. So let me give you concrete examples so we can build up a kind of intuitive understanding of the whole thing. So the first is an embarrassing example. My neural network only has one neural. So I'm dealing with one single variable. Then in the, in the latent space, I have a single variable Gaussian that's, that is boring. But I can pass them through this single neuron. So I got uh, a bimodular distribution in the physical space. And that is reversible. So that's an example for a single variable case. And uh, for more kind of a physical example, let's consider two uh, coupled harmonic oscillators. So in the physical space, because there's a coupling, so uh, that distribution is a tilted Gaussian because the coordinates, they had a correlation. And uh, then, in that case, uh, to get an independent Gaussian variable, the network essentially wanted to get central mass and the relative uh, motion degrees of freedom and uh, compress them so I got uh, isotropic Gaussian. That's the example, the intuitive understanding of uh, this network. However, the crucial thing is that uh, in general case, where I have many variables, and I have uh, nonlinear interactions between them that go beyond the quadratic level. Then I need to have many of those blocks stacked into a hierarchical fashion to help me remove the correlations between them. 
So that's the logic of having this uh, deep kind of a mirror type network to do this uh, uh, renormalization flow from physical to the latent space. So uh, that's a, an, another crucial com uh, component because typically a neural network is not reversible. Okay, think about the feed forward neural network. Typically people do not run backwards. However, uh, this is really active uh, frontier of deep learning research that people try to construct reversible neural network. So that, that was the work from DeepMind called the normalizing flow. But we are using this particular construct, construction from Google Brain. It's called the real MVP. So it's not that important. Uh, the crucial thing is that uh, this block is a differentiable and a reversible mapping between uh, variables. So that it forms a group, uh, deformorphism group, means that you can change them. You can assemble many building blocks of those uh, project, we call it bijector, to form a larger bijector. Okay? So this gives us a modular design because you can assemble them in a different architecture. And uh, for that, we got lots of uh, kind of inspiration and uh, principled guidance from information theory and from tensor network. Because we have to assemble those projectors in the right way so we can capture the complexity in the actual data, in the actual physical model. So um, that's about architecture. Next, the crucial thing is uh, how to uh, train the model, how to fix the number of parameters given the kind of uh, architecture, given the model. So uh, here we are doing a variational free energy calculation. So that's actually a crucial point. Now, I'm not relying on anybody to run Monte Carlo simulation to prepare data for me. I want the network to learn from the bare energy function of a stat map problem. So that's why the only input to this calculation is uh, E of x, that's energy function, okay? Think about molecules, IC model, FIFO theory, that's action, or if you want. And uh, uh, this term then is the entropy of the model answers. By model, I meant the neural network that gen directly generates answers. So if you combine those two together, you got variational free energy. Uh, you can prove that um, this is basically uh, equivalent to minimizing the so-called reverse KI divergence between the model probability density and the normalized uh, uh, Boltzmann distribution of your physical problem. And uh, uh, in physics, we call this uh, gibbs bogolikov feynman inequality. And uh, in machine learning, uh, typically this is so-called rational inference. But it's the same thing. But uh, here, again, the crucial point is that uh, we are learning on the data generated by the model itself. Okay? So, uh, here is the interclude just to make this uh, kind of a clear. So uh, WaveNet is uh, actually a key component inside Google Assistant. When you use it to make phone calls to order pizza, it can produce very realistic human sound. So 2016, they had this construction of WaveNet that actually uh, learn on data. So it can, it can generate physical, uh, realistic uh, human speech. However, even from this movie, you see that it has a drawback. So the sampling is rather slow. It takes, uh, for example, two minutes to generate one second of sound. So it's not uh, useful in practice. So then in 2017, they uh, upgrade the setup. So this is co then called the parallel wave net. You can already see some kind of similarity with our setup. So essentially, it maps input noise, which is Gaussian, directly into human uh, speech sound. So it's a physical uh, kind of a uh, distribution. We are talking about. And to really train this neural network, we were using this technique called the probability density distillation. So because this network is not suitable for training on data, it takes the distribution of another network. So that's why in 2017, they were training this parallel WaveNet on the WaveNet from 2016. So essentially, in our kind of variational free energy calculation for StatMac, we are doing exactly the same thing, however, on our physical problem. So let's actually see the result for uh, the IC model, also my favorite model. So first of all, this is the rational free energy. So uh, that's a good point of testing that on the exact solve model, because answer has told us about the uh, exact lower bound. So since this is a rational calculation, there's no worry about overfitting and so on. The 
lower value of the objectivity function is always better. Okay, with the stronger and the better or larger uh, network, uh, you can push down this variational energy even further. And what is the network uh, learning uh, during the training? So here I'm plotting the directly generated samples from the network. So initially it uh, all looks like a random Gau a Gaussian variable uh, noise because the network knows nothing. But as a function of training, so basically the network gets more and more understanding of what about the physics from the energy expression. Now you see that uh, it knows that, okay, for the IC model, the physics should be domains and, uh, and uh, all kinds of uh, spin flip excitations. So you see that uh, at the later stage of the training, it directly maps the Gaussian distributions to the quite physical uh, appealing domains. And uh, obviously you see that this is the already something you can use in combination with Monte Carlo to uh, help you to uh, got uh, samples with very high efficiency. So another crucial point is that uh, here I'm not only getting samples from the network, I also get the score, meaning the likelihood, together with each sample. So that allows me to perform additional rejections on this sample to ensure the calculation is unbiased. Because if I'm doing that using GANs or VA, VAEs, there are two drawbacks. The first is that for this model, I have to train on data. That means I already rely on someone else to generate data for me. The second thing is for GAN and uh, VAE, uh, I do not get likelihood. That means uh, I just get a sample that, that I cannot, I do not know whether I want to trust or not. Yes, please. Yeah, right. Uh, for, for this, I did not, but uh, it's, it's easy if you want. So there are basically two stages of the calculation. So if you want to do variational calculation, this is already sufficient. You got all the sample. On the sample, you evaluate physical variables. However, if you really want to make uh, the whole thing unbiased, you can apply rejection on top of this. Then in that sense, the, the network becomes a propo proposal machine that directly proposes the, the yeah, updates to you. So what is network? actually learning. So I'm plotting two point correlation functions for uh, different layers. So in the physical space, you see, since this is the critical icing, you got long range correlations, it's all over the place. But if you move one layer up inside the network, so you see that since the purpose is to decouple some of the variables from the, uh, the, the physical distribution, so you see that uh, um, I already got some block structure. Uh, so only within these collective variables, I got uh, correlation. The, the remaining ones basically is uh, uh, independent variables. So if you move to a higher layer, basically you get a few and a fewer uh, collective variables within them, you get a correlation. So uh, in that sense, the network progressively decouples degrees of freedom from your network. So this is a bijective, invertible mapping. So it's, it does not throw away any information. However, um, if you like the conventional RG distribution, that uh, if you already decouple something away from your system, so then it's just a matter of language, whether you are actually throwing them away or you just keep them as an independent variable. And uh, how do we understand uh, the meaning of those physical variables? So uh, I'm, I'm just drawing kind of the connection to one of the limiting case where if I impose that all the blocks is doing linear transformation, for example, the one we saw for the two side harmonic oscillator case. So in that limiting case, the network re reduced to a wavelength transformation. So basically for each group of input var variables, I got so-called smooth and uh, they call it smooth and detailed kind of uh, components. Basically the slow and fast degree of freedoms. And you're only doing transformation to the, set, uh, to the smooth part. So that's the application to imaging the nano. But uh, this is also the case where uh, several different uh, things match. Because you can view this as a wavelet. You can also view this as a tensor network, the simplest kind of tensor network. Again, this is also a, a quantum circuit because it's a unitary, it's an orthogonal transformation. Again, this is the, the simplest case of our neural RG setup. But uh, starting with this common kind of uh, intersection, 
a different class of model departs there, and they tries to address different kind of problem. So I would say that in general, this kind of nonlinear neural network uh, tries to have an adaptive and nonlinear generalization of the wavelet because in general it can depart from the fixed linear transformation of discrete wavelets. And uh, how is it going to be useful? It's going to be useful, for example, in connection to the previous talk. It can be used to identify independent variables in your realistic simulations. For example, I'm thinking about path integral Monte Carlo molecular dynamics because I'm getting those independent variables and also I'm having the effective energy on those variables, which is close to a Gaussian. That means it's a way to derive effective field theory for me in the latent space. And also, since this is invert invertible information preserving RG, it's also going to be useful for holographic mapping, the study of ADS safety. I I'm going to show you examples. Um, and again, for the obvious reasons, this is uh, kind of a uh, good machinery for studying Monte Carlo. So, uh, what do I mean that? So Monte Carlo is always about wandering in some kind of space. However, in the physical space or in the imaging space, it's hard to sample because all the pixels or all the physical variables have a strong correlation. However, the idea of having a latent space with much simpl simplified distribution uh, gives you ability to interpret between phases, between uh, different features of the human face because there you got independent component. So applying this, this idea, again, I'm, I try to emphasize that this is a quantitative uh, kind of a mapping, different from GAN and other things, because uh, uh, not only we get uh, the uh, latent variable, we also got effective uh, energy. That means you can perform, for example, Monte Carlo sampling in the latent space with uh, much shorter equilibration time, because basically you got the independent variable in that space. And uh, uh, just to confirm that, I also computed the mutual information in the latent space and in the physical space. You see that uh, since this is critical, I think, in the physical space, you got quite strong mutual information between the two. So that's uh, basically a measure of independence between the variables. However, in the latent space, you got to reduce, greatly reduce the mutual information. And how is uh, this useful? Uh, thinking again in terms of the disk language, I'm writing uh, this network back into this disk. So all the physical variables live on a boundary, and uh, then I have an equal number of latent variables, this uh, yellow crosses sticking out of the um, disk. And uh, the way of the RG flow runs from the boundary into the bulk of this disk. And typically, when people draw such a diagram, they meant uh, tensor network and so on. However, I want to say that this is a neural network. It's not a tensor network. And each block is a bijective uh, block. So why is this good? And this is basically gives you a new way to uh, play around, to study this holographic RG setting. Because uh, what these people care about is that if you, ha if you have a critical field theory on the boundary, then there would be some remaining correlations or remaining mutual information between those latent variables in the bulk, as we uh, just saw in the previous slide. And this defines the emergent geometry in such a disk. So uh, that's this kind of uh, uh, understanding or the perspective uh, of this uh, bijective neural network. Uh, I'm wrapping, wrapping up now. So, um, I hope that uh, uh, this is telling you that uh, uh, the modern uh, kind of uh, generative models can really enrich our understanding. Also, it's a nice toolbox uh, for us to study many of the static and quantum physics problem. And the second point being that in the reverse direction, so designing and understanding generative model actually has lots of physics uh, inspired inspirations. For example, one of the earliest generative model, Boltzmann machine, was directly coming from stat statistical physics, and uh, the latest addition, the Bohr machine, so basically use a quantum circuit or tensor network square to model probability, is actually coming from quantum physics. And I, I'm going to spend one minute about this fluid connection, because as you already uh, saw, that the idea of generative model is always about transforming probabilities. And, uh, 
there was a mathematical domain called the optimal transport theory dealing uh, particularly with this kind of transportation. So initially it was care about transportation of Earth in Paris. But uh, anyway, so those probabilities, they satisfy the so-called module ampere equation. But you can, you can kind of uh, take that equation into continuous time. Then surprisingly, the result would be some continuity equation of the fluid. So equations aside, so the intuition is that uh, you can really view in the continuous time language that probability density as a density of a fluid. And then the neural network becomes a water pipe. And the learning of the general model is equivalent to an inverse of kind of fluid control problem. You want to design the water pipe in the right way such that the flow with a simple density flows to a rich and complex density. And uh, this also addresses the problem of why we need to have a deep neural network. Because this is a dynamical system. We have to let the flow, uh, to, flow to, to, to evolve for sufficient time so it can reach the final density. Also, as an outcome, if you uh, discretize this continuous equation, you will automatically get ResNet and so on as a neural network architecture. Anyway, the bottom line is that, that with this setup, you will get even stronger block uh, for this uh, bijective mapping and for, them, for that uh, uh, to um, have the better version of answers. So that's it. Thank you for your attention. Yeah.